Hey everybody, Jeremiah Clark, Lawrence Electronics. Out here in the shop again as a continuation of our Lawrence Live webinars. This is the fourth, I believe, now in our series, and we're continuing where we left off last week on a, on a kind of a basic setting, setup, and installation of the HDS Live product line. Um, we're not going to go too much back into what we covered last week. If you guys have any questions on what we covered there, you can always go to lawrence.com slash live. At the bottom of that page are all of our archived uh, webinars that we've already done, so just go back and rewatch one of those anytime you get a chance. I do want to remind you that are new to the chat or those that are rejoining, that live on the line we have the Lowrance product team and a lot of Lowrance product experts that are standing by to answer your questions. Uh, we'll try very much to answer all of them as much as we can. Uh, the last couple groups we've had a, a lot of people on and we haven't been able to get to all those questions, so it's important that when we send out the follow-up survey to this, that you guys, if there was a question you asked that wasn't answered, please post it there and we'll do our best to get back to you. HDS Live's got a lot of functionality, a lot of features that it does. Uh, we're not gonna get into all of them today. What we do, we'll have is a continuation of these going forward. Uh, so if there's a topic we haven't covered, let us know what that is and we'll look at making a future webinar or a quick tip video out of that topic. So jumping right back in, I did wanna give you a quick recap HDS Live is the premium Lowrance product, and not only is it the premium, the top of the range for Lowrance, it is the top of the line, the best fish finder on the market. It's the ultimate fishing system. It is used by more professional bass and walleye anglers than any other product combined on the professional, on the, the top tier professional circuits. So again, as like I said, last week we covered the basic install, the basic setup, the what's in the box. How do I take this thing out of the box, put it on the boat, and kind of get it up and running? And we try to keep the webinars to about an hour. We respect your time and we don't want to drag you out too long. And so we had just gotten into some basic sonar setup last week. I'm going to go ahead and jump back into some of that in here in a little bit. Uh, but for now, we're just going to go ahead and jump into a quick intro into how to actually get around the product and what are you looking at um, when you go, when you get the unit turned on for the first time. And so we're going to go ahead and do a little basic walkthrough tonight of how do I get around the user interface. Uh, some basic setup stuff. We'll, again, we'll pick that up. What can I set up in my garage or my driveway before I go to the lake for the first time so I don't have to mess with that when I'm on the water? Uh, so we're going to do that, and then we'll jump into a couple little things on some sonar settings and side scan settings. Uh, we do have a future session planned on charting, so I'm not going to jump too much into that. And again, if there's a topic you guys want us to cover that we haven't covered, send us that in the follow-up questionnaire that comes out, and we'll jump into that. So jumping right into the product in the home screen. When we designed our first touchscreen product with HDS Gen 2 Touch, um, we wanted to make the easiest to use, most intuitive product on the market. And after tons of research and tons of consumer feedback, we came to there's nothing more intuitive of nothing more easier to use than a graphically based layout. The button looks, if I see a button that says sonar, it looks like sonar. When I touch it, I'm going to get sonar. Uh, and we wanted to lay this out in a way that you guys could uh, quickly, easily access things uh, you know, your, your main features, your side scan splits, and all these other things. But what I wanted to do was kind of break the screen up into thirds. And the first I'm going to talk about the left third of the screen. This is basically where all of your settings and your data live. So when you go into this gear icon at the top, this is your system settings page. If you go right down here, waypoints, this is where you have waypoints, routes, and trails. You can edit, you can manage. If I want to change a name or an icon of something, I can do it right here and save that and now it's saved there if I want to delete by symbol. So a lot of fishermen, um, they will fish and use specific symbols to indicate certain things where they saw structure, where they saw fish, where they want to start working a bank, where they stopped working the bank. So you could actually delete everything by symbol. You could delete all, that's a, that's a sketchy button to play with and we don't just take it for granted. You push it and we ask you a few times, are you sure you want to do this? Uh, you can sort by name, you can sort by what's closest to you or, or if you're one of those symbol fishermen, you can sort by symbol. And then you can also find. And then within this menu, we also have routes and trails. So that, again, when you go to the left side of the home page, settings and data are the main thing. So alarm is a setting. Vessels is a setting. Info is data. This is if you're a coastal fisherman, this is where your tides come in. This is where your sun moon calculator comes in. A lot of people don't know that our fish finders for 20 years have had built-in sunrise, sunset, and what phase is the moon built right into them trip calculator in the middle if you want to see how far you've gone a given day, what your average speed was, how long were you out. All of that is under the info page. So again, data. And then storage. 
So a lot of you take screenshots. A lot of you will want to, you know, take a screenshot and save it to an SD card or look at it later. This is kind of your file system on your, on, your, on your HDS. This is where you go find things and view things. So again, left side of the screen is data. The center part of the screen, I guess if you want to think of this like your phone or your tablet, these are your main apps, I guess, if you want to call them that. And you, this data will automatically populate or depopulate uh, most of these features based on what you have available. So this boat has 3D sonar. This boat has a Mercury engine. This boat has live sight on it. So these icons aren't normally there if you were just to take one out of the box at your house uh, and you didn't have 3D or you didn't have the Mercury vessel view link on here. Those icons won't show up. So these dynamically populate based on what the HDS finds on the network. Another thing that a lot of people don't know you can do from here is, and we'll get into building custom pages here in a second, but if you wanted a, what we call a quick split, you wanted a chart and a sonar split screen, but you didn't really want to take the time to set one up, or you're on the water and you haven't, you haven't set up your favorites yet, all you have to do is press and hold that chart icon for a couple seconds, and now we have pre-built splits right there. So I just tap this and now I have chart and sonar. So all of those function, all of these products have that, or the, the apps have that quick splits. So you could access those right there. Most people, what they end up doing, it takes me to the right side of the screen, is these are your favorites. These are like if you think of the preset buttons on your car radio. This is the channel I want to go to and you know when I'm doing this. And we preload a few of them for you. So we have a, a chart and a sonar one. We have chart and side scan, and then we have sonar and side scan. What I want to show you guys that is super simple to do on our products, and it's been imitated but never duplicated by some of our, our, our friends in the industry, is how easy it is to actually build a split screen panel. So one of the most common ones you see people run is they'll put chart. They used to pull in sides or sonar, but now with we have uh, fish reveal on downscan, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about fish reveal here in a second, I actually pull in downscan instead of sonar now. And then I pull in side scan. So this is, you know, basically charts here, down scan with uh, fish reveals here, side scans here. Uh, another great thing we do is we give you the ability to decide how you want to lay it out. Me personally, I like chart in the top left. I like side scan in the bottom in this nice long quadrant, right? Why do I like that? Side scan is a lot of data out to my sides. This gives me a representation out to the sides where if I were to put it up here, I'm squishing that data into a much smaller area and I'm putting my sonar image down here. So me personally, I like this view. Uh, a lot of people actually run this view where it's side by side by side. But let's just go ahead and go back to my favorite because I'm the one running the keypad here. And I can now save this. So I see at the bottom I can clear, I can discard, or I can save. So I've got everything where I want it. I've got chart where I want it. I've got down scan where I want it. And I've got side scan where I want it. And I hit save. So now, if I were, in, if I actually had some running sonar, which I can simulate here in a second. I'm in the garage, so I don't actually have an active sonar panel. But now I have down scan, side scan, and my chart, just like I wanted to lay it out. From here, another thing you can do that people uh, have, don't really, un, maybe not know exactly how to quickly find, is how to adjust the size of these splits. So not only do we let you decide what to put where, I can, pick how big I want this to be. If I want my side scan down at the bottom and I only want the most recent data, but I want a really big down scan column and a really big chart, I can do that. Um, if I want to basically take this and pinch it all the way over, I don't need that much chart. This isn't what I'm driving. This is all, this is a sonar trip. I can do that. Really, the, 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 the trick of this is just set it up how you want to see it when you're on the water. Uh, and again, this is another reason we're going through this kind of garage series now is these are the things you can do before you can even get to the water. If you get this unit and set up, or if you already have a boat set up with these units, and you just want to get it tuned up and dialed in before you even go to the water so you can spend your time fishing and not playing with these. So you can add quite a few. Uh, you know, you can keep adding. Or if you have one, if you've filled up, I think we have a total of nine spots you can take. If you filled them up and you want to get rid of one, or if you decide, I really would rather this be sonar than downscan, all I have to do is press and hold that icon. And now I get a wrench or an X. A wrench is an edit. It takes me back into the edit screen. An X is a delete. So if I filled it up and I just, I thought I was going to use this view, but I never do, and I just want to get rid of it, I tap it and it's gone. So that's my, that's my screen broken up. Again, information and settings on the left 
your main apps in the center, and then your favorites, your, your presets, your radio buttons on the right. And again, this makes it just super easy when you go to the water just to be able to just tap that and have the view you want. <clears throat> the next thing I want to talk to you about from the home screen is the actual settings uh, menu or the settings page. So there's two ways to get here. You see the gear logo in the very top. This is our main settings. So this is where you go in to, to do your, your finish up your settings, to finish up your boat setup. Uh, when you turn the unit on for the first time, this will be where we pick back up from last week on kind of getting into some of those initial setups. So you can get to it from the home page. You just press the button here that takes you home. This is like the home button on your phone or your tablet. And you can touch it here. Or if you're inside, uh, say you're inside sonar and you wanted a quick way there, you can press and release the power key real quick and then it brings up what's called system controls. Within system controls, I have standby. Standby turns the screen off and it stops the sonar from pinging, but it doesn't turn the unit all the way off. Last week we talked about how these are computers and they can take a little bit to boot up. So if you wanted to save some battery, you're, you're done at the console, you hop up, you're gonna go fish at the bow. And you don't wanna leave this big 16 inch screen sitting here on full brightness, but you don't necessarily wanna wait for it to boot up next time. All you have to do is hit standby. That'll put the unit in a low power mode. You'll get this little screen saver. But then all you have to do to bring it out is just tap your power key again and we're up and running. There's no boot up time, there's no slow load time. You have power off, you have your brightness, you have night mode. Touch lock, if you're out using this in real tough conditions, again we talked last week that HDS Live is full touch or full key. So I could actually turn the touch screen off so I don't worry about accidentally bumping something and just use it as a keypad. And then down at the bottom, we've talked about edit overlay, we'll talk about data overlays here in a second logging sonar, uh, direct access to our registration and CMAP Embark. But the reason we came in here was the settings. So we're gonna, that's the other way back in. So remember I could go there from there or from the home page just by touching the gear icon. And again, kind of in that theme of first time turning it on or getting it set up the way you want it and not have to mess with it when you get to the water. Uh, we're gonna look at the system settings first and there's a few in here that are pretty key. Uh, by default, uh, I think we, we, by default we select English US but we do have built in a ton of different languages. So if English isn't your native language uh, and you wanna pick a, a different language, that's easy enough to do from here. The next one I wanna talk about is text size. So, uh, you know, I, I, if, you're, if you've got great eyes and you're, you're a young guy and you wanna get more screen or more info on the screen, you can go to small. By default, we run normal. But as we get a little older, we all know our eyes aren't as good as they used to be. So, you know, you could go to large. So again, that's just a personal preference setting. I usually run mine on normal because I'm 40, I'm not young, I'm not old, I'm kind of that weird right in the middle. Um, you have key beeps. Personally, I can't stand key beeps. Every time I touch the unit, I don't want it beeping at me, so I turn mine off, but we have quiet, normal, and loud. Um, probably the reason I can't stand key beeps is I've either built or sold these things for 20 years, and every time I touch a button, I don't want it yelling at me. So I turn mine off. Um, some people like them on, so that way they can tell when they've actually interacted with the product, it'll give you an audible beep. So time, right now where I'm shooting this from, it's 6.15 central time or 6.14 central time. Our units get time and date from the GPS signal. However, they don't adjust direct to your time zone. So I, when you first turn this on, you may have to adjust for your time zone. So now I just bumped up a couple times at 6.14 p.m. Another thing is daylight savings time. You'll need to jump that up or back. Within here, you can select 12 or 24 hour, and you can select the date format if you wanted months first or days first. But the time is the one that is important to remember, and it's right there in settings system, and it's the fifth one down. A feature we added with HDS Live that we added this, um, when we go do seminars or when we do consumer focus groups, people always come up to me and they say, man, I wish you had a button to do this one thing. But if I sat in a room with 100 of you guys, I would get 92 different answers on what that button should do. So instead of picking for you, on HDS Live 12 and 16, we've put four keys down the side of this unit. These keys are not pre-programmed anything by default. Um, so that's what we can program quick access keys. And I was gonna show you guys a quick way to get there. If you have a brand new unit that you've never programmed, any key that's not programmed, if you press it, will take you straight to that menu that we were just looking at. And within here, so the top key, I can choose that to be a waypoint. I can choose that to be a waypoint of a specific symbol. I can make it take screenshots. I could trigger man overboards, measure distances, pause sonars. I can raise and lower my power poles. 
If I have this connected to a NEMA 2000 stereo, I could make these my, uh, my volume up and down buttons, uh, my track skip buttons. I can engage my trolling motor anchor from here or engage course lock or trolling motor standby. I could also set these buttons to take me to specific pages. The moral of that is not, not to try to show you everything it can do is the fact that it can probably do what you want it to do. Uh, so if you're a waypoint fisherman and you like to fish uh, spawning fish in beds, if you're a tournament guy, every time you bend over and touch the unit in the springtime, somebody watching you goes, oh, you just saw a fish on a bed. So if you have to bend down and drop a waypoint, you know, you could easily make that, you could make that be a, a different key on there and make it be different symbols. Um, you could also, a lot of people have asked us for pre-programmable to take them straight to a certain page. So if you wanted a button to take you straight to your sonar page, and then you wanted a button to take you straight to your, uh, let's just say your chart page. When I save these, now I press here, I press here. I don't have to go home, chart, home, sonar. I can just go chart, sonar. I can set this up as one of my favorites. Again, pretty much customizable to anything you want. On the 12 and 16, there's four of these. You can also press and do a program that is a press and hold. So in effect, you get eight buttons on a 12 and 16 that you can set up to do whatever you want within these menus. On all HDS units, seven, nine, 12, and 16, the pages key on a long press can be set up as a quick access key too. So if you can't afford a 12 or 16, but you still wanna drop a waypoint whenever you you know, you wanted to drop the green fish waypoint whenever you see a, a bedding fish. So now, in effect, at the top of the screen, I have two waypoint keys. I have my regular one that is just new waypoint at vessel, or I have, if I press and hold the pages key, I've now created a waypoint at that spot with the symbol I told it to use. So, you know, quite a bit of flexibility and functionality in those, and that's a feature that a lot of people don't know we fully have. And again, trying to think through how to make this simple, how to make it easy to use is why we basically have the, if you press the button when it's unconfigured, it takes you straight to the page to set it up. The last thing in the settings page that I wanted to talk to you guys about is the wireless remote. I don't know how many of you guys know, we actually sell an optional wireless remote for HDS Live and HDS Carbon. It's called the LR1 in the US it retails for $99. And this remote, basically, you could drop a waypoint with it. You could zoom your chart with it. But if you see at the very top, those buttons, they, they're made to mimic the quick access keys on the HDS. Those are pre-programmable too. So if you wanted to wear this around your neck and change your sonar views from your favorite pages without having to bend over and touch the unit, if you're that bed fisherman I was talking about and you don't want to give away your dropping a waypoint, you have a waypoint button on your neck right now that you could wear. This comes with a neck lanyard. It also comes with like a, a wrist strap. Uh, that you could strap it to something. I've seen people strap them to steering wheels uh, so that way they could zoom their chart up and down while they're driving. Uh, but you know, you go into your system settings from there, wireless remote settings. The first time, so we've never had this unit turned on before, we have to turn the Bluetooth on. So we turn Bluetooth on, then the process, you just follow what it shows on screen. It's press and hold the plus and minus keys to have the remote pair with the display. Full on screen instructions. You do that until the unit uh, blinks, until the remote blinks. And now you just go to your Bluetooth devices list. There's my LR4 remote, or my LR1 remote. It's paired. And again, now I have this wireless remote settings page that I can program short and long press just like I can these quick access keys. So if you like the quick access keys, but you wish you, that you had them in your hand, it's right here with an optional remote. The thing I like the most, again, like if I've seen the guys strap it to their chart, I can, zoom in my chart without actually bending over to do it. So if I'm driving along and I want a, a better view of where I'm about to run into, I can easily zoom in without having to reach over and interact with that. So that's the LR1 remote. That's the last thing I want to talk about under the actual system settings. There's a lot more in here uh, that are a lot more advanced settings in terms of data, coordinates or datum coordinate systems, your heading, magnetic variations. If you ever want to see if your GPS is working, you just go to the satellites page and you can get a, an idea of how many uh, satellites you're locked onto and what the signal strength is. But that's the last thing I kind of want to dig into in here. Uh, the rest of that, if, if you're somebody that needs to change your chart datum or change your coordinate system, uh, you're probably somebody, I mean, hop into the manual. I think that's something that's a little bit more of an advanced setting that we probably won't go into in this level of setup. But that's, that's the remainder of the systems menu there. 
The next thing, and this is a bit of a refresher from last week, but this is so important to us that I wanted to cover again, is the sonar settings. Um, so last week we did a quick intro that these three of these top four icons in here are really the ones you need to worry about. Um, they will, so channel one, channel two, a quick rehash. Channel one is regular sonar and live sight sonar. Channel two is where you'd put a, an active imaging side scan or down scan transducer. And they enable or disable based on what we find in terms of automatic transducer identification. And we talked about that some last week, that like an active imaging three-in-one transducer can tell the HDS that it's an active imaging three-in-one transducer. So not only does the HDS turn on channel two, but it knows what's there. Uh, this one I have an in-hole puck on, so I actually have to manually turn on channel one because cha the in-hole pucks do not have the automatic identifying um, information. So one thing I kind of wanted to go into, and you'll see where this is important when we get to the actual sonar page, is we talked a little bit last week about the installation. Um, and so again, here's channel one. I've got it set as my PDWBL, so that's my in-hole puck. <clears throat> but one thing we didn't get to last week that's actually pretty powerful is you see it's channel one here. Here's all the settings that you can go through and adjust if you want to adjust your depth offset or your temperature. But if you see where it says source name, right now when I look at this on my sonar panel, it shows this unit channel one. And if I look at the other transducer, even though we know it's an active imaging, it'll say this unit channel two. If I go right here and I put puck and I press enter and save, now my source is puck. So I'm gonna go do the exact same thing for my channel two. I'm gonna go to installation, I'm gonna go to source, and I'm gonna say this unit channel two. And I'm going to name this one AI3 in 1. And I save that. So now when I go to change my source, I don't have to guess what's on channel 1 or what's on channel 2. Do I want to look at my in-hole puck or do I want to look at my 3 in 1? So that's a fun little setting that we don't usually talk too much about, but it makes using the product on the water so much more simple. And again, this is something to do in the driveway. Uh, once you have this set, it's going to make your life on the water much easier especially if you're trying to look at maybe this sonar from the bow unit and you're trying to figure out which, uh, which one was channel one, which one's channel two. Don't worry about channel one, channel two. Just name them what transducers you know you have in there. <clears throat> the last thing in here that I wanted to reiterate from last week is the source, the network sonar mode. So again, we have multi-source mode. Uh, which allows you to see multiple sonars, as, it, as it's called, multi-source, multiple sonars from around the boat. So if I have a trolling motor transducer in the water locked on, and I have a transom transducer in the water locked on, I could actually view those simultaneously. Uh, the other thing it allows you to do is, again, more, for more of our coastal friends, if you have two transducers, maybe one is a different angle or one is a different frequency, and you wanted to see those both at the same time to get a better picture of what's going on below the boat, that's multi-source mode. <clears throat> Only HDS Gen 3s, Carbons, and HDS Lives running the latest software can run multi-source mode. If you have a Gen 2 touch or older, in your network at all, plugged into Ethernet, you cannot run multi-source mode. It's gonna run single source mode, which is fine. You can still look at any active transducer, but you can only look at one at a time. It does also determine where you go to pick your active sonar. So in multi-source mode, I have this button that says source. In single source mode, I would have a list of every available frequency right here. So it'll say 200 kilohertz channel one, 200 kilohertz channel two, and it'll list them all right here. So depending on what mode you're in, depends on how you pick your active sonar. So the next thing I really wanted to talk into before we actually jump into some of the, the actual sonar uh, tuning and tips and tricks, again, this is garage setup is really around some of your network setup. And we talked about this a little bit last week, but I feel like I kind of had to rush through it because we were running short on time. Um, the units, when you first power them on and you go through the steps we talked about last week, will auto configure. They'll look at the network and they'll find everything that's out there. If you add something or if you don't see a source that you want, all you have to do is hit this auto configure button. You'll get a little dialog that pops up, says this will remove any invalid sources and add any valid sources. So we do that. Uh, for the sake of this, I'm going to have to turn simulator back off so I can show you guys the, the setup. I'll turn simulator back on when we go to look at sonar pages again. Uh, but once you do that, we actually will go out and say if there's a 0.1 antenna, we'll find it. If there's a temperature, we'll find it. That doesn't necessarily mean that's the source you want to use. For most users, that's great. 
Uh, if you're more of an advanced person and you want to set up this point one to only work on this unit, you need to go into data sources. And this is where you can actually pick the specific sources you want to use. So on this boat, I'm going to use my point one, which is already automatically selected. Um, when I want to look at my sonar, I'm really interested in where I'm getting temp from. So this one obviously doesn't have temp since that's an in-hole puck, so I'm going to leave it on my three and one. And then depth. So this is one that we get calls on a lot in service. And we actually change this menu specifically from customer feedback and based on that. So you'll notice up here with temperature, I actually have a value, right? I have 77.1 degrees. It's 77.1 in the shop, according to my active imaging three and one. For depths, I don't actually have an active depth. I just have dashes. So in the past, uh, if we didn't have an active depth, we wouldn't even show you the available source. That's what auto configure does. Auto configure says there's no data available. It's not a valid source. But we realize that a lot of you guys are doing what I'm doing right now and I'm setting this up in the garage. So you want to be able to see your sources. So what we've done is we've added every available source here. But this is another reason why it's important to name those sources in the installation. So take some time, go through those setup steps, make sure you pick the right transducer if it's not automatically picked for you by the transducer, and then take the time to name it. So now I can say, I want my depth actually, I'm going to have my depth number coming from my in-hole puck not my active imaging three and one. On this boat, it's mounted a little higher, so it may come out of the water at speed, but that puck is gonna maintain a, a bottom lock the whole time. So even though it's an invalid source, I can pick it, and as soon as that source gets a bottom lock, I'll have that as the depth number. Kind of the same, we had some questions last week about you know engine data and all these other things. We, again, with the auto configure, we look out there and we know that there's an engine connected, and we know that that engine has a lot of these pieces of information. So all you have to do is you just go in, and again, it's invalid right now because I have my motor switched off, but if I switch the motor on, all of my data would pop up here, and I could actually just, all you have to do is pick one, we'll get a dialogue that pops up and says, do you want to use this for everything else, and you say yes. At that point, your engine's totally configured, so when you go to your, in, when you go to your info page, or your instruments page, or if you have your Mercury engine, all of the data like RPMs, temperatures, anything that motor's outputting will show up there because you've selected that. Um, so that's pretty much the rundown on the data source panel, and I, I, I could probably spend an hour on every single menu and every single button in here. So again, if there's something that you want more in depth on, uh, first go to YouTube, uh, Lawrence YouTube, youtube.com slash Lawrence, and look at our quick tips. Oftentimes we've covered things like autopilot setup, engine configuration, some of those things. We've got a lot of technical support documents online about um, engine connections, so a lot of those are there. But when you get the survey from us, if you can't find the data or if, you know, if it's not readily available or quickly accessible, give us the comment on what you'd like us to dig into deeper next time. One of the things that we did get a lot of feedback on from last week, and I wanted to spend some more time on, um, doing this in the shop is not as good to me as doing it on the water. But I do want to go ahead and go through some of the basic sonar settings. What are the buttons? What should I play with and why? What shouldn't I play with and why? Uh, and so I'm just going to kind of give a quick rundown of what all of these do. Um, I'm not going to go into super detail with it, but with it running in simulator mode, as I've just now turned back on, you can see the changes I'm making like you'll see them on the water, but I think you'll understand and relate to them a little bit better um, when you're on the water. So one thing we're looking at doing in the future is actually trying to figure out how to do one of these live from the water. Uh, and you could actually see the impact of these changes, but for now you just have to live with me in the echoey shop uh, showing you on a simulator data. So as we go through the menu, the first thing you'll notice is mode. Uh, when you pick, when you I think we talked about this last week, but one of the first things for the overwhelming majority of Lowrance users, uh, we fish 60 feet or less in water, especially people that fish lakes and rivers. So always pick shallow water mode if you fish less than 60 feet of water. If you fish fresh water, but you fish deeper water, if you fish the Great Lakes or a lot of the, you know, the, some of the lakes in Europe that are, that are quite a bit deeper than what we have here, uh, you can pick fresh water. What this mode does is this tells the sonar where to start searching if it loses bottom or the first time it's trying to acquire bottom. So if I have this set deep and I have it looking at a 10,000 search, 10,000 foot search depth and I'm in five feet of water, it's going to take forever to find the bottom. So for me, for what I do, I always pick shallow. Um, my alternative would be if I were, again, fishing in a deeper lake, I might pick fresh, but I usually just pick shallow and leave it. Uh, shallow, fresh, and deep are the, the three main ones. We do have an ice fishing mode. We do have a slow trolling mode and a fast trolling mode. Those, those change your uh, scroll speeds and your ping speeds a little bit. 
But for the overwhelming majority of the people I talk to on a day-to-day -day basis, pick shallow water mode and leave it there. And then as we go down the list, the next one we have is range. There are two ways to use range. I usually uh, leave it in auto. Um, the only time I wouldn't leave it in auto is if I really wanted to keep the, the, the fish finder sitting at a specific depth. So here my bottom is 42 feet, but when we went over this little culvert, this where this roadbed used to be, that's 22 feet, so it may range up. If I know I'm gonna go through an area that has some elevation changes and I want it to just stay where it is, I may just pick a depth and leave it there. But for just driving around the lake, general use, I usually leave it in auto mode and let the unit figure out what range to pick for me. <clears throat> the next one you'll see on here is frequency. And again, this depends on what you're doing. It also depends on what transducer you have connected in it and done in the installation menu. So with this one being the active imaging three and one, the available transducer frequencies I have are 200 kilohertz, 83 kilohertz, high chirp and medium chirp. Now when I interact with these in the sonar, this is what I was saying, it's gonna be a bit of a disadvantage not doing this one live. You can't see the changes here. Uh, but basically, 200 kilohertz is going to be your, your, your higher resolution, your, your more defined uh, picture. 83 is going to be wider. So if you're doing something like trying to track jigs or you're trying to see if there's you know, a wider cone angle to see if, if there are more fish below the boat than just specifically under the transducer, you would pick 83 or medium chirp. The chirp frequencies, with those what you get is you get a clear sonar signal. These are actually recorded in chirp. Um, you get a clear sonar signal you get better target definition. So where you got these targets that are stacked up on top of each other, uh, like you can see right here on the bottom, those are actually four targets, bang, 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 right on top of each other, that when you have chirp uh, going, not only do you get a clearer picture, you get much better target definition and much better target separation. So I usually, in, in the lakes I fish in, again, shallow lakes, I usually run high chirp. Um, very rarely will I switch back to 200 anymore now that we've introduced chirp. Uh, and then if I want a wider cone angle, I want, to, I want to see a little bit further out than that narrow 200 kilohertz, I'll go ahead and kick over to medium chirp so I can actually see wider fish arches, track my lure better uh, when I'm drop shotting or vertically fishing. Uh, the next one you'll see on here, and you can see an impact of this one in the simulator sensitivity. Now in the bottom of this screen here, you see where it says auto. I always, unless you've uh, been using fish finders for 20, 30 years, I always recommend leaving it in auto, even the experienced fish finders. Uh, uh, fish finder users, I feel you could actually benefit by leaving this in auto and spending less time tinkering with this. What auto is is basically saying as you transition depths, bottom hardnesses, uh, you know, a structure in the water column, uh, thermoclines, surface clarity, we will dial the gain for you. Um, and we'll go ahead and do all of those calculations automatically. If you take it out of auto, you're basically saying, I know what I want to dial in for my conditions. Uh, and you, you're taking it into your own hand. So you could play with it, but I recommend if you get lost or if you, if you make it look bad, always just go back to auto. That doesn't mean that you can't tweak it. So inland anglers, we tend to like more stuff, right? Because even though we're seeing this little speckle of noise, look at these little targets up here that as I turn down that noise start to fade away where I can see them now. So I want to see more targets. I actually may do auto plus. Uh, people that like a cleaner water column, don't like all this speckle, don't care about the tiny little fish, they should do maybe an auto minus. You see, it doesn't take a lot of clicks to clear that up. You know, that auto minus three has gotten rid of almost all the noise or all the speckle in the water column, but hasn't really degraded the targets too much. But again, that's still auto plus or minus. So that means as I change depths, as I change bottom hardnesses, as I, as I move around the body of water, the sonar is still doing the auto tuning for me but it's doing the auto tuning with my bias preference. It's up or down, whatever I like to see. So again, I'll say it over and over until I'm tired of saying it. Always leave it in auto and then just bias to get the view you want using the sensitivity auto plus or minus. Color line. People ask me, you know, what's the difference in color line and sensitivity? Sensitivity is basically the volume knob. I can blow the screen all the way out. I can turn it up where I get everything. I can turn the screen all the way down where I get nothing. So this is my gain, this is my, bottom, this is my volume knob. This is what do I wanna see, you know, how much detail, how much uh, do I wanna see at one time. Color line doesn't change really the volume at all, but what it does is it changes what colors a, a, a signal that's reflected come in as. So in, in like this specific palette, and we'll talk about palettes in a second, the brighter the color, the harder the surface. The, the closer to blue the color, the softer the surface. 
And what we can do with color line is we can actually play around with where does that hardness, uh, where does that yellow show up? How, how, um, how intense does it show up? When does it show up? What is considered intense? I could turn this all the way up where I can't see any difference. Mainly where this feature is used is people that are bottom fishing and they're looking for transitions and bottom hardness, uh, going from soft to hard, hard to soft. Or some people, you know, will use it to in the other direction. You know, you dial it down, you can really see that yellow to red transition. Some people in the other direction will use it to see the intensity of the sonar return. So if you watch some of these fish targets, I can actually pull some more yellow into these larger ones, into the middles, by going up. But when I'm doing that, I'm also losing kind of some of that bottom. So color line is personal preference. Again, there's no, you're not actually messing with the picture too much other than you're determining what is hard and what isn't hard. And usually default plus or minus a couple is a pretty good way to go depending on what you're doing. Um, so we already talked about source, but I'll mention it again. Again, I've named these. So I didn't name my HDS 7 that's in my dash. It still shows up as HDS Live 7 Channel 1. There's no transducer plugged into that. So if I were actually, I just restored this boat and set it up uh, you know, from scratch. So I haven't actually turned that one off. But I would actually go in and turn that sonar off in the same menu I showed you guys here how to turn sonar on. In my dash unit, I need to go turn that channel off. So that way it stops broadcasting itself because there's no transducer connected to it. So it's really not a valid source. Uh, so I would do that, go turn that off. I could do that right now, actually. Sorry, you have to stare at my big head for a second. Now it's gone. So now I've got a nice clean uh, source selection. If I were to turn my, uh, my bow unit on that's connected to my uh, HDI transducer, my ghost trolling motor, you'd see it here as a source as well when you're in multi-source mode. Um, we'll go into more options and then we'll come back to advanced. So more options in here if you want to just stop the sonar from pinging, you just hit the stop sonar button. Uh, maybe you're next to a, a, you know, somebody that's got their sonar on, you guys are both tied up to the same dot or bridge or, or, you know, and you're both fishing and you don't want your sonar to blow out theirs. Um, or if you had a different transducer on the boat that you didn't want to interfere with, you could stop the sonar right here. Splits, basically you can do a split zoom where I zoom the part of the water column but I leave the rest the same. I could do a bottom lock. Uh, this is more of a coastal type feature if I'm fishing for bottom fish, but I still want to see the whole water column. So on the right hand side, I have zero to my bottom. Here is the bottom seven feet or from the bottom up seven to ten feet so I could bottom lock. And then for the old school guys in the room, if you wanted to turn on a flasher view, you can. Um, I usually leave that on no split. Palette, and we'll talk about palette again when it comes to uh, structure scan. Uh, but palette, again, is personal preference. It's, it's, it's how your eyes see. It's what you're looking for the day you're fishing. Me, personally, I like 1 or 13. So they're the same from the, from the surface or from the bottom up. They're the same. The difference is uh, with 13, we color everything from the bottom down as brown. Well, with number one, I leave everything exactly as the raw sonar return so I can see that bottom hardness. So if maybe if I'm looking for a fish right off the bottom, but I don't want to see the, the bottom hardness, I could turn on 13 and pick those fish out right off the bottom. But if I'm looking for bottom hardness along with those fish, I'd leave it in one. We have a lot of choices in here because there's, again, there's no right answer. Your eyes see differently than my eyes see. Um, you may just visually like something better than I do. You may have come from a different brand that uses a certain color palette and you liked their color palette. Uh, so we've, we've kind of come close to some of those. Uh, for me personally, I never go beyond one or 13, but that again is just 100% personal preference. Uh, overlay down scan, we don't use much anymore. I want to show you a different feature we do called fish reveal when we get to down scan. Temperature graph is just a line at the top that sets a minimum and a maximum and lets you know if the temperature's fluctuated. Depth line colors the bottom with the black line. It's probably really hard to see on your screen, but there's a black line that pops in where we're picking the depth out. And then A scope, again, for those uh, kind of more of the old school guys that want the raw data right now, this is the data as it comes into the sonar processor before it gets rendered into an image. Again, this is really more of like a drop shot vertical fish, and you want to track that bait and track the fish movement in real time. You can do that. Uh, and then down at the bottom, uh, a feature that we have in here that um, I, for entry level users is a good intro, but I think once you learn how to read a depth finder, or a fish finder, uh, I would prefer to never have fish ID on. Fish ID is putting the, the fish symbols on top of, or instead of the arches, on top of the arches. Um, personally, I like to see the arch because I can tell thickness, I can tell relative size, 
I can tell how many they are. Uh, and then you could even turn on the beeps every time a fish pops into the screen. So that's the, the more options menu. The only other thing in here I want to talk about in sonar is advanced. And uh, really there are four settings in here. There are two of them that you will probably interact with more than others. Uh, the top one is uh, noise rejection. Noise rejection is exactly that. If you have a, a noisy pump or if you get some interference coming from a trolling motor, um, you know, something outside interference that's coming in and messing up your sonar screen, you can turn noise rejection on. I like to think of, and my, my sonar engineers don't love it when I say it, but it's how I relate to it. To me, noise rejection cleans up noise from the bottom up. A lot of radiated noises in what I call the water column, this portion here, towards the bottom up. So when I play with noise rejection, I'm trying to filter out that noise down there. We have another setting called surface clarity, and this is really in there to, um, when we have, especially in inland lakes, we have a lot of uh, flow, we have a lot of runoff, we have a lot of current uh, in rivers, uh, those kind of things. Surface clarity cleans from the top down, and it's really to help filter out. Uh, some people don't like to see the, the, the debris at the top or the, the noise at the top. So there's different levels of settings there. So surface clarity filters from the top down, not exact, you know, noise rejection filters from the bottom up. They're trying to tackle different things. Surface clarity is trying to tackle uh, turbulence or, you know, turbidity in the water and noise rejection is trying to tackle exterior noise. Scroll speed, if you wanted to speed the unit up to scroll faster, you can. It doesn't mean you're getting sonar data any faster. What it means is we're moving the screen faster, so pixels tend to get dragged out or stretched. Um, <clears throat> again, you could do that. Some cer certain fishing applications, you want to be able to see more information like that. You could even slow the scroll speed down. I would say the average user never is going to play with scroll speed. Um, I usually leave it on normal. And then ping speed. Ping speed is how fast is the transducer sending out that, that, that ping, 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 ping that we're sending into the water. By default, we ping at our max rate. Um, by default, we ping at our max rate. The, uh, you can slow this down, and the reason that I would say that you might want to mess with ping speed, again, if you have multiple units on a boat or if you're fishing next to a buddy and you're interfering with each other, sometimes varying the ping speed can clean up some of that noise. I got a couple questions here. Okay, so um, right here in the top of the screen, you'll see I actually have a depth because I'm running my, my simulator. I'm going to turn the simulator off real quick, and I'm going to show you what it looks like when you don't have a depth lock. We get this question a lot. Um, what does it look like when I lose bottom lock? Well, in the top, here in just a second, that depth number is going to go to three dashes. If you ever see three dashes on an overlay, that means that we do not have a bottom lock, and it may take a second to actually clear that out of memory. Leave here and come back. There we go. So now I have dash, dash, dash. If you see that, that means you don't have a bottom lock. You may still be getting a, a sonar picture. Uh, we talked a little bit last week about the importance of transducer installation and placement and maintaining a bottom lock. So if you're fishing and you have a good depth number, and then as soon as you take off, you get dashes and a really garbled sonar picture, you might want to go back and look at that transducer install and that transducer placement. Uh, how to log sonar. So if you ever wanted to log sonar, there's a couple reasons you might want to log sonar. There are actually three that I can think of off the top of my head that are pretty useful. One is if you just wanted to go back and play it again later. Within the unit, you can actually replay a sonar log and go back and look at what you've already seen with sonar, which is exactly what our simulators are. These are, these are files that we've actually gone out and logged. Um, the other reason is if for some reason you have a service question. Sonar doesn't look just quite right. Sometimes they may ask you to log sonar. Or if you like to use our Insight Genesis service and you log sonar to upload and actually make maps out of it, uh, you can do that. So th to log sonar is super easy. You just press and release the power button. You press log sonar. You can name the file. Uh, you can you know, pick where it's saved to. So this will save to a memory card and hit record. So that would actually save directly to the memory card, and when I'm done, I have it on the card. Those are the basic sonar settings. Again, doing this uh, on the water would be a little bit more informative because you could actually see surface clarity and noise rejection in real time. Uh, here we don't have that uh, capability. Uh, we are 45 minutes in, and I've got just a couple more things that I wanted to chat about. Um, I want to talk about the settings and uh, side scan and down scan as well. So on this one, again, you have the same thing. You have range, and again, I leave it in auto. The one that I don't leave in auto all the time, and you know, I tell everybody leave everything in auto all the time, the one that I don't leave in auto all the time is side scan. 
I may want to see side scan at a different range than what the auto uh, algorithm is going to provide for me. So like right here, this is recorded data. You'd never have this on the water. But I don't like, you know, like seeing those dead spaces. That bothers me. So I could, you know, I can actually manually select it. When I'm out fishing, I use side scan for two, two main reasons. One is to see where is there structure or fish that I'm not actively fishing. And so I could go highlight these fish sitting on the road that are 100, like 97 feet away from me to the left. And I'm fishing right here. I can see those out there. The other use case I do is if I were actually fishing a bank, and let's just say I'm going along a bank, and I know this is a, a road bed and 40 feet of water, but we'll just have to imagine it's a bank now. And I wanted a more up close view of that, and I can see these fish targets here. I will manually select a much shorter range. It's well within my casting distance. So to know exactly what, what is within my reach right now. So I use uh, side scan as a search tool to see what's out there at a higher range, say one, 100, 120. It can go up to 300 feet to each side, depending on transducer installation, water clarity, turbidity, all that good stuff. But really, most of the time, I find myself using it when I'm searching 120 to 100, and when I'm fishing you know, somewhere between 80 and 40. Um, so that's, that's the range. On down scan, I usually just let that auto range, just like I do sonar. Again, unless I'm trying to maintain a specific image all the way across. If I know I'm coming across this hump and I don't want it to range up over that hump, I would just go ahead and manually pick the range. Contrast. So we talked about sensitivity being the volume knob in sonar. Contrast is the equivalent in side scan and down scan. You can see by playing with a contrast, I can really blow the picture out. I can overly clean the picture up. Uh, again, this is, a, this is a personal preference. Again, I still leave mine in auto, but depending on what I'm doing, what I'm looking for, I may do auto minus or auto plus. Uh, so in this scenario where you've got a nice hard bottom, but you've got these trees on these drop-offs, I may want to see the trees a little bit more. So auto plus three or four, those trees really pop off without really distorting the bottom structure too much. If I want to see the bottom structure a lot better, I may actually dial it back just a little bit so I can actually get these shadows without, you know, you watch the intensity here as I go up, how the dark areas go away. If I go up really high, those dark areas just become one uniform color, where if I'm trying to see, is that a rock bottom, is it a sand bottom, you know, what's going on down here? If I back my auto sensitivity off just a little bit, I can actually start getting more contrast between bright and, uh, and dark, and I can usually tell hardness that way or structure that way. So again, it depends on what you're doing. It's personal preference for your application. If I were fishing right here, I'd go auto plus two or three so I can see these trees um, and see those fish very well in those trees. So I was saying earlier when we were going through the sonar settings, there's a feature called overlay down scan that we don't use that much anymore. And that's because we have fish reveal. That's what you see on the screen right now. So fish reveal, the super quick two, uh, primer on that is what we used to tell people with side scan and down scan was to run a split screen. You'd have sonar on one side, you'd have down scan on the other side. And that was because people always said, I love the detail that I get from downscan. I love the structure. I love seeing the trees, the rocks, the, the bridge pilings, but I can't see fish. On downscan, fish show up as little tiny dots. And, oh, I'm on the wrong side. On downscan, fish show up as little tiny dots. So if you turn that off, the fish are just gonna show up as little dots. You don't get these nice arches. What we've done with fish reveal is we've actually We actually, so here's the dots. That's a fish, that's a fish, that's a fish. With fish reveal, what we've done is we've actually just pulled out those sonar arches, just the fish arches. We leave structure looking like structure, we leave bait looking like bait, and we actually put those fish arches directly on the screen. I've stopped my sonar on accident, boy, sorry. We actually put those fish arches directly on the screen, so now I get the full picture-like detail of the structure, but I also get those fish arches, so I don't have to split screen anymore. On something like a 16, probably not as big a deal to run a split screen as something like on a seven or a nine. So you guys with those sevens or nines, like my seven and my dash, instead of split screening to really small units, you know, with side scan or down scan on one and sonar on the other, I can run it one big full screen. Within fish reveal options, you'll see I have my same sonar controls I had before. And this is where I do a little tweaking, right? This doesn't affect what your regular sonar looks like. I want to basically tune this the way I want to see it. So that's the default. I think that's too hot, too bright on my fish arches. So on fish reveal, I usually back that off a little bit, but I leave the sensitivity alone. There's no point in turning up the volume or turning down the volume. 
I just changed the color of the arch. I can also change the color, the actual color of the arch by playing with the palette. So you can tune this to, your, again, your eyes and how you like to see it. But if you haven't played with Fisherville, if you have downscan and you have sonar and the same transducer next to each other, this is probably one of the most powerful features we've launched in a long time. Um, people always ask me about palette, and this is probably the last thing I'm going to have time to go into before we open the Q&A up, um, is people ask me about palette. Again, just like I said on regular sonar, palette is a personal preference. You can't do it right, you can't do it wrong. We have 10 of them in here. Again, your eyes are different than my eyes. When I'm fishing on super bright sunny days, I may want this blue palette, or if I'm fishing on maybe a dip, you know, overcast day or something, I may want something a little bit more muted, uh, you know, one of these brown or gold ones. So again, personal preference, fits the application. I, again, I have my favorites. I have ones that I never turn on. Uh, but again, that, that just because I don't like or use something doesn't mean that you won't. Um, and then the only other thing we have in here in advanced is, again, surface clarity. Remember, that's just cleaning up the noise you can see here in the middle. So here it's off. Maybe it's probably a little bit more effective on downscan, but you can see the, the noise that we've gone through here, the, just the, 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 the speckle in the water column. I can actually clean that up without actually affecting the image too much. So this is a place that I actually do play with surface clarity a little more than I do when I do sonar. Sorry, I just saw a question pop up that I'm not going to answer on camera. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then the only other thing you can do in here is you can do uh, one of the other kind of settings features that's nice that a lot of fishermen like is range lines. So if you go into more options on the bottom of your structure scan or your down scan page, you can turn on range lines, which just gives you indications without having to go, oh, that's 50 feet. You could say that's 50, that's 100. Just quick reference. Uh, some people like them, some people don't. If you're fishing just the left side of the bank and you want some more screen real estate, you could look at just the left side, just the right side, or you could look at both. Most people leave it set on both. Again, that's where I go back to loving this view now that we've talked about fish reveal, talked about side scan on my chart, is now that we've got that, I have my fish reveal on my down scan, I have my side scan, I have my chart. So I basically have every view that I want, uh, just did a quick access exactly how I want it laid out. Um, that's 55 minutes of me talking to you guys about basic settings. Again, this is not the last one of these. If your question didn't get answered or if there's something that you're looking for in, in specific detail that I haven't covered, I'm more than happy to, to, to review all, I look at all the feedback you guys send. We've got a list of topics that we need to cover again. What I'm going to do right now is go to a little bit of live q and I've got a few that popped up here. Um, so some of these, I'll, I'll, I'll take some of the quicker, easier ones, and I know there's a lot of good stuff here. Why do people, somebody asked me, why do you need a point one if the unit has a built-in GPS antenna? The point one is a GPS antenna, but it's also a heading sensor. So if you guys have ever sat still at the dock or when you're drifting and your chart's just spinning around going crazy, that's because GPS charts use your boat movement to determine your direction and what direction you're facing. So if you don't actually have a heading sensor, the GPS is saying, I'm drifting this way, uh, I must be going this way, and it'll turn your chart around in a direction that you're not actually facing. The point one gives you a heading sensor that's basically an electronic compass. It says, my boat's pointing this way, disregard what the GPS is telling you in terms of the direction to spin the chart. It's still taking your, you know, your, your spot in terms of where you are, but it's, it's, it's steering the chart for you. Um, can I do a, okay, so somebody just asked me, is it possible to do a split screen with more than one uh, structure scan view? And the answer to that is yes. So what I'm going to do here, I'll just go ahead and I'll have down scan. I'm going to do side scan, side scan, and sonar. And what I like to do here is you guys see this panel right here. I actually have a layout specifically for this. So I can set side scan on one side, side scan on the other side, make this chart instead of sonar if you want. And now I just, it's one quick setup. So right now I have full side scan on the left, full side scan on the right. All I have to do is go into more options, make this one left, go into more options on this panel, make this one right. I'll make the color, pa the color palette match. And now I have my left on the left, my right on the right, my down in the middle and my chart. So that's a view that we've added to, the, 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 to these units. It is a, a super handy view. Um, 
We've got some questions on mapping, live mapping and uh, color map shading. We're going to cover those when we talk about mapping next week. So you guys pr may have noticed, which is probably where the, the question came from, that I actually have my chart shaded on this. So I have uh, shallow water shaded red and then I use a red to green gradient for safe. This does two things for me. This tells me one, if I'm, if I'm kicking it across the lake, where is it safe to drive? The other thing it can tell me at a glance is where is a point, where is a ledge, where is a drop off? You know, where are spots I should be actively fishing, especially this time of year with fish moving up on points and on beds, I could quickly pull those out that I may not otherwise see if I wasn't using a color ch uh, shaded chart. So I'll show you real quick, I've got this turned on. This is what the default chart looks like. So it's still good, it's still got the same level of contours, but I don't think I get at a glance what I get when I actually do a custom depth shading. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in our, in our charting session uh, that we're gonna cover either next week or the week after. Um, how do I, we had a question on how do I set up Livecast. Check last week's feed for that. Uh, Livecast is the ability to use the HDMI and the USB on the back to input data from your phone or tablet. I covered that in last week's setup session. So again, anything we've already covered, go to lorance.com slash live, scroll to the bottom and you can actually see the, the previous sessions we've done. Um, There's one in there that asks about uh, setting a specific uh, setting for the transducer above the, uh, for the, the point one above the transducer. This one's a, a pretty advanced setting. We've got, there's some documents on this and probably some videos on this, but we do within our data sources have the ability to force a unit or force a, a, a device to only be uh, seen at a certain place. So like my point one antenna, I could pick it I could go to, oh dang it, it's been a while since I've done this one. That's under data sources. So uh, again, I'm in simulate mode. So if I have my point one here, it'd show up here. I have a drop down that says scope global or local. If I change this to local, that device is now more or less tied to this display. So if you had a point one at the bow and a point one at the, at the transom, and you wanted those, uh, those GPS antennas to be directly tied to dropping waypoints on that unit. This is how you would go do it, is you'd select that point one from the list, you touch this little blue triangle, you select local, and now that device is local. Uh, that's, pretty much, that's a pretty advanced setting, but that is something that a lot of people on a boat like this would do. Um, that's pretty much my hour. Again, remember we're gonna send out a survey um, asking some questions, and if, you, if we didn't get to your question, I tried to get through most of them that I could see here. Uh, we we will we'll follow up or plan a future webinar. Um, I do want to remind you guys again for the third week in a row, our friends over at Angler Labs are having a, a, a webinar or a, a chat right after this with host Shea Baker and tonight's guest is Lawrence Pro Jordan Lee. Uh, so that's presented by Angler Labs and Mercury Marine. Just go over to facebook.com slash angler labs and you can, you can catch that session. So thanks again for another week of your time. I very much appreciate you guys spending your nights with me. I know there are things that we'd uh, you know, like to be doing and get out and fishing, but in the meantime, let's, let's take the time to learn about these as much as we can, figure these things out, and that way when we're ready to go, we can just hit the water and fish. Thanks and have a good night.